Okay, next infection involving the layers of the heart. So myocarditis is an infection of the muscular layer of your heart. Um, the myocardium, remember that one? That's it. So inflammation of your muscle layer. Usually it's caused by either a virus or bacteria, but it can also be caused by a fungus or a parasite of some other kind, um, which makes it a little bit difficult to diagnose and figure out what has caused the myocarditis. So we really need to find out if the patient has been ill for an extended period of time leading up to the myocarditis. So for example, if they had the flu, if they had strep, if they had anything at all, we need to know about that because that's going to let us know you know, really which direction to look in to try to diagnose and see why they have myocarditis at this time. Um, so here's just a list of the common causes um, of myocarditis. So I just really want you to remember that it could really be anything, okay? So we need to get a good patient history if we can. So ask a lot of questions of the family members and, um, and of the patient as well. So the myocardium can become inflamed, um, and it also can become inflamed because of the use of toxins or um, in chronic alcohol abuse or cocaine abuse, um, radiation, or some other autoimmune disorder. So like we said, we're looking at if they had an infection leading up or if they're overusing some of these other kinds of toxins or if they've had radiation to their chest area at all also. Okay. For some reason, um, patients who have bulimia and use Ipecac to help them purge or to throw up their food after they eat. Um, they end, end up having a lot of damage to their myocardium that can appear like myocarditis and so we really need to rule out if they have a history of eating disorders or anything also when we're looking at diagnosing this issue and seeing what is causing it with this patient. Um, the cardiac muscle tissues, they swell up um, and that can really interfere with their ability to stretch and recoil which means, you know, it messes up the ability for the muscle to work. So like when you flex your bicep, Right, it's stretching and then recoiling, stretching and recoiling. Same thing happens within your heart muscle. Okay, so if those cardiac muscle tissues are swollen and aren't able to do that so well, then it's interfering with the heart as a pump. Um, and I always do this because that's what I think of, it pumps it out, you know. Um, so the cardiac output is going to be significantly decreased, uh, which will then um, interfere with their circulation to all of your extremities and um, the rest of your body. But your right or left side of your heart can eventually fail because all of that blood will be backing up since it's not leaving the heart to go to the rest of the body. You can end up then having ischemia just because you have a reduced oxygenation to your body, um, and that can end up causing dysrhythmias and tachycardia, everything too. So we really need to look at a lot of things when we're looking at myocarditis. Um, the patient is going to feel a sharp stabbing or squeezing kind of chest pain and it really resembles an MI. So a lot of times when patients first discover that they have myocarditis, um, we need to rule out that they haven't had a heart attack first before we can go on and see what's causing this chest pain. They're also going to have probably a low-grade fever, some tachycardia, dysrhythmias, dyspnea, malaise, fatigue, pale or cyanotic skin. Um, these patients just do not feel well really at all. Um, they also, like we said earlier, can have right-sided heart failure or left-sided heart failure. Now the signs and symptoms of right-sided heart failure is that they can have jugular vein distension or ascites or peripheral edema because as the blood is backing up, backing up, it's going to back up through the right side of the heart and then back through the superior or inferior vena cava into your jugular veins and the rest of your body, which is going to cause a lot of swelling, and it'll eventually start um, seeping into your abdomen as well and causing that ascites. If they have left-sided heart failure, then it's backing up into the lungs, right? So if it's backing up into the lungs, then you're going to start hearing those wet, gurgly, crackly sounds um, within the lungs as well. You also might hear an S3 gallop. Um, which is just an extra heart sound, and it kind of sounds like bum, 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 okay? Or you can hear a pericardial friction rub, which is, if you remember from a previous video, um, the friction rub sounds like squeaky leather, you know, like, ear, ear, like that really annoying squeaky leather sound, and you can hear that when you listen to the patient's heart. To diagnose it, we want to get a CBC, and we are going to see an elevated white blood cell count because they have some kind of infection and inflammation somewhere in their body. Coupled with the CRP and ESR levels, that's going to tell us that they indeed do have some kind of general inflammation in the body somewhere. It's those nonspecific 
um, infl inflammatory test to tell us if there's something going on in the body. So even though we can't see it on the outside, we can see it on the inside based on these lab results. Um, the cardiac enzymes will be elevated, um, probably not that troponin though, because remember that one's specific for the MI, but we will see the rest of the cardiac enzymes elevated because there has been damage to the myocardium. Um, we want to get an EKG or an ECG, it's the same thing, um, and that will end up showing us that there's some kind of abnormality within the rhythm um, to let us know that the heart is not functioning properly. A chest x-ray and an echocardiogram are going to show us um, you know, the structure and function um, being disturbed in some way. So the heart's going to be enlarged. You're probably going to end up seeing fluid in the lungs, um, reduced ejection of the heart, which means the pumping or the amount of blood that's leaving the heart is going to be significantly decreased. Um, we want to get eventually a biopsy of the myocardium, and that's going to give us that definitive diagnosis. And when we say definitive diagnosis, that means we're figuring out what caused it, what's happening now, how we're going to fix it. Okay, so that's the bedrock of what we need to know in order to move forward into treatment. And to treat it, we've got to figure out whatever that underlying cause is so we can either hit them with some antivirals or steroids or antibiotics or anything. Um, antibiotics are our standard choice to treat if it's a bacterial infection that's caused the myocarditis. But all of our patients, we want to put them on bed rest because with a damaged heart, they need to be resting and decreasing the workload of the heart um, as much as possible so that the patient can um, you know, keep health status as much as possible. We want to restrict their flow sodium intake to try to um, restrict their, so their fluid. Well, I'm tripping up on words, fluid and sodium. Anyways, we want to restrict both of those, right? Because we don't want them to end up having a lot more swelling than what they need to have. Um, digoxin and other cardiac drugs will help um, also to decrease the workload. Possible heart transplant. This is kind of our worst case scenario. If we're not able to treat the underlying um, cause of the myocarditis and the heart is not repairing itself on its own, then they will need to be put on that heart transplant list in order to um, move forward in the future and have a healthy heart for the rest of their lives. So as a nurse, we need to monitor them for signs and symptoms of heart failure or any kind of dysrhythmia. Take their vital signs regularly. This is something you cannot cheat on. Vital signs are vitally important, right? That tells us the health status of our patient in five minutes or less, okay? Daily weights, that's going to tell us, again, the swelling or, um, you know, accumulation of excess fluids and stuff, too. Um, we want to take their eyes and nose because that's going to give us a good indicator of how well they are processing all of the fluid in their body and all the blood through the heart and everything as well. It's going to tell us if they are holding on to too much fluid because of the swelling um, or if the body is processing it all through the kidneys and everything as well. Um, we want to get their O2 saturations because we need to know if they're retaining oxygen enough or if they're not getting that oxygenation um, to the bloodstream as well as they need to. Um, listen to their heart and lungs. Um, their lungs, like we said, if they've got that left sided heart failure, we can hear the crackles and gurgles and nasty sounds. We want to check them for edema, promote rest, gotta rest, um, put them on a cardiac monitor or telemetry just to keep a close eye on their rhythm. Um, if they have a fever, give them some antipyretics just to try to bring that down and decrease workload on the heart again. They probably are going to need some supplemental oxygen at some point, and so keep that handy um, and know, you know what steps you need to take to do that, which will also help to decrease the workload on the heart. We want to elevate the head of the bed just to help promote their breathing as much as possible and decrease um, you know, the strain and the stress that it takes to get a deep breath when they're lying flat. Um, I have telemetry on there twice. It's very important, so you need to know it. So anyway, um, all right, so that's myocarditis. We're going to finish this video.